morning. <laughs> morning, Abby. <laughs> Let us pray. The veil of darkness transformed to the brightest light. The most dreadful end became the most beautiful beginning. The depths of despair fade to reveal hope everlasting. The curse of death defeated by eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder of Easter. The first reading this morning is from Corinthians chapters uh, 15, 1 to 19. The resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I proclaimed to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what we believed, the resurrection of the dead. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been then raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people must be pitied. The second reading comes from John 20. It's found on page 135 of your few Bibles. The Empty Tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked, in, and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separated from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture that the Jesus had to rise from the dead. Jesus appeared to Mary of Magdala. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she went over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. 
The woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking, that, thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples of the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said these things to her. So end of this reading. So this morning, Cedric led us in a service on the, on the beach. It's probably one of the most magnificent mornings, just perfect in, in every way. Cedric couldn't have timed it better as he got to the, the readings about the resurrection and the sun just broke out from behind the clouds. It was truly magnificent. So a group of very clever people were having lunch at a local cafe. They realized that the salt shaker contained pepper and the pepper shaker was full of salt. A debate ensued as to how they could exchange the contents of each shaker without spilling. Following a lively problem-solving conversation, discerning all the facts, the group landed on what they believed to be a brilliant solution. They would use a saucer, a napkin, and a straw. So they called the waitress over to impress her with their solution to the problem. Ma'am, they said, we could not help but notice that the pepper shaker contains salt and the salt shaker pepper. Oh, the waitress interrupted, sorry about that. And she proceeded to unscrew the caps of both bottles and switch the caps. <laughs> the solution to the problem was not complex. It was actually really simple. The resurrection of Jesus is not that complex. It's actually quite simple. It's a straightforward truth. It's not complicated. Jesus died and he rose from the dead as he said he would. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, the scriptures tell us. Jesus, as he promised, rose from the dead. That's a fact. The resurrection of Jesus is vitally important to us for many reasons. Jesus kept his promise to rise from the dead so that we will believe that he keeps all his promises. Jesus' resurrection gives us the assurance that we too will be resurrected because because he rose, we will have the gift of eternal life. And that is hope. We don't just die and all ends. We rise to life in Christ. The resurrection is the substance of the church's witness to the world. We don't tell lessons to the world from the life of a good teacher who roamed the earth for a few years. We proclaim the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that our God is alive. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we have the certainty that our sins are indeed forgiven. And the power of, of God that brought Christ's body back from the dead is available to bring our spiritually dead selves back to life so that we can change and we can grow and continue to become more like Him. Romans 8 and verse 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies brought by by Spirit who lives in you. That same Spirit lives in you. The resurrection is not that complicated. It's quite simple. It's a fact. It changes lives. It, it brings hope. There was Peter and John. John tells us their story. They run to the tomb. They don't, they don't only look into the tomb, but they actually go inside the tomb, and they're amazed that the tomb is empty. But there's something else that they, that they note. If someone had removed Jesus' body, if tomb robbers had been at work, why would they leave the grave clothes behind? If you're going to steal a body, you would take it wrapped in its clothes because you wouldn't want to, be, you wouldn't want to touch a dead body. And if you're stealing a body, you won't want to take the time to, to neatly fold the head cloth and then leave it behind. You're in a hurry. You won't arrange the strips of cloth just like the body had been lying there. There's just no point to that. If you're going to steal the body, you're going to do that quickly and get out. Something else strikes Simon Peter, that the grave clothes were not disarranged. They were not lying in a pile or scrambled up. They were lying there, John tells us, still in their folds. 
And that's what the Greek means. The clothes were lying exactly as if the body had been there. The napkin lying exactly where the head was. And the whole point of the description is that the grave clothes did not look as if they had been taken off or stripped off Jesus by some grave robbers. They were lying there in the regular folds as if the body of Jesus had just simply evaporated from it. As if Jesus had just passed out of them, right through them. They looked like an, an empty cocoon from which Jesus had emerged. The headpiece still rolled up in the shape of a head. And it was about the right distance from, from the wrappings that had enveloped Jesus' body. A grave robber couldn't possibly have made off with Jesus' body and left the linen still perfectly shaped. And Peter and John in that moment suddenly realized what had happened and they believed. They believed. It wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that complicated. Let me remind you that Thomas needed to place his hands in the wounds of Jesus to believe that he had risen from the dead. But Peter and John, they didn't need to do that in order to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Risen from the dead. They saw the grave, the grave clothes, and John tells us in chapter 20 and verse 8, they saw and they believed. It was enough for them to believe that Jesus had risen, this empty tomb. Thomas, he had a unique experience, we may argue. He touched the hands and feet of Jesus, put his fingers in his side. And that led him to believe. But Jesus says, of those of us, that's all of us, that have not had that experience, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are you. You and me, like Simon, Peter, and John, we haven't seen. But we believe. We're not able to put our, our fingers into the wounds of Jesus but we are able to see that there's an empty tomb. And we believe because of the empty tomb. We believe because of the changed lives of, of people around us. We believe because of the carefully documented events of the death and, and resurrection of Jesus. The evidence is indisputable. We believe because the Bible tells us that he would die. The Bible tells us he would rise. The Bible tells us that he will come again. And so we believe as we choose to walk by faith and not by sight. The stone had been rolled away that first Easter Sunday morning. Not so that Jesus could get out. He could get out anyway. He didn't need the help of anybody to get out. The stone was rolled away so that Simon, Peter and John could look in and so that they could believe and see that the tomb was empty. Jesus had risen. The stone was rolled away so that you and I could look in and believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. There's Mary Magdalene, John tells us. She played a significant role in the life of, of Jesus. Jesus had ministered to her. He cast the demons out of her. She was at the foot of the cross. She watched him suffer and die. Now she finds herself at the tomb, wondering who rolled the stone away and where have they put Jesus. And she stands there crying. And then Jesus arrives and he has a conversation with her. Mary find herself wandering around the tomb. And for some of you this morning, maybe that's you. You don't see and believe instantly like John. You don't want and you don't need all the evidence and proof like Thomas. Maybe you like Mary and you're just wandering around, trying to, to work things out for yourself. Could the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus be true? And you desperately want it to be true. You want to believe he died rose again. You need a miracle maybe to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Mary wanted to see Jesus that morning more than anyone else. She stood at the foot of the cross. She watched him die the most cruel death. She didn't run away like the other disciples. She stayed there. And when Jesus was placed in the tomb, it was Mary who went to the tomb was the first to see that the stone had been removed and rolled away from the entrance. And then a miracle was about to happen. She was about to see Jesus. The same for all of us. Eventually we get our little miracles in some beautiful way. Like for Teresa, she prays with her hand on the chairs for years. And eventually she gets her little miracle. Her family come to believe that Christ is alive, risen. Christ meets us. Sometimes it's unexpectedly. Like with Mary, he simply appears to her in the garden. 
She didn't even recognize him at first. And then he calls her by name and he says, Mary. John tells us Jesus knows his sheep by name. He calls us all Louise, Leslie, Jeff, Francis. He knows our names. And Mary says, I've seen the Lord. So Mary believed because she had this personal experience. She had this encounter that day with the risen Lord and Savior. And today many Christians believe in the resurrection not only because of the evidence, but because they've had a personal encounter with Jesus. We need to open our hearts this Easter Sunday to Jesus and experience his presence by faith. I'm going to conclude, and I just I want that picture just to go back up, Sean, of um, yeah, Thomas. It's a picture, it's a painting by an artist called um, Caravaggio, Caravaggio. And that's Thomas putting his fingers into Jesus' side. Quite a well-known painting. Thomas, as I said, was the skeptic amongst the disciples. He wasn't the disciple that was present when Jesus first appeared. And the other disciples told him that they'd seen Jesus. Thomas says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side, Thomas says, I will not believe. I will not believe. In the painting, it, it looks like Jesus is pulling Thomas's arm towards him, putting his fingers into his gaping wound in his side. Scripture tells us that a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. That the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And Thomas says, My Lord and my God. On this Easter Sunday, you've been privileged to see a family make that confession. They've said, My Lord and my God. Will you do that? Will you come before the Lord and confess Him as your risen Lord and Savior? The Bible doesn't say confess that Jesus is Lord and believe He fed the thousand or confess that Jesus is Lord and believe He walked on water. No, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You witnessed that this morning. John shares this truth with us in his gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May you have life on this day that he rose from the grave. Amen. Congregation, we are going to stand and Prepare our hearts as we come to celebrate in the sacrament of Holy Communion and sing together. Mm -hmm.